Good morning. My name is Erin Kimmerly. I'm a forensic anthropologist and professor of anthropology. I first fell in love with anthropology when I was a child. My mother told me that you could travel around the world, live with people in different cultures, write books about it. I was amazed that that was an actual job and I uh, knew that it was something that I had to do. After college, I moved to Washington, D.C. Like most people who are 21 and starting out, I wasn't real sure what the next step would be. But sometimes life has this way of opening up doors that are unexpected. And there were two job opportunities that came up. The first was actually at The Gap. They were down the street from where I lived. But the second was in the anthropology department at the National Museum of Natural History, which is part of the Smithsonian Institution. It was a dream job. They were looking for osteologists, people who know about bones and could help identify Native American remains that had to be ultimately repatriated and returned to the tribes. I showed up for that interview, nervous, of course, but relying on all that time I spent in college in the lab, in the biological anthropology lab, trying to learn about bones and human variation and what it means to do biological anthropology. And I shared my enthusiasm and willingness to learn to do whatever it took. Fortunately, although the Gap didn't hire me, the Smithsonian did. And I spent two years on a contract doing that work and just took advantage of it as an incredible learning opportunity. After college, uh, I'm sorry, after that time, I um, decided to go back to school to finish my education and studied my master's at the University of Nebraska and ultimately went for a PhD at the University of Tennessee. I chose Tennessee because they really focus in forensic anthropology and had this idea that you could take those skills from the lab and apply them to real world problems. And in this case, the problem was long-term missing and unidentified persons. So through that study, some more doors opened up, some more possibilities. And I ultimately went to work with the United Nations in the Balkans. They were putting together large international teams of people to investigate war crimes and genocide. This was in Kosovo in 2000, just a year after the war stopped. Our mission was working for the Office of the Prosecutor, and it was to locate and excavate mass graves in order to look at the remains for trauma. What was the cause of death? Could we prove that crimes were committed? It was hard work at times, sad, but it was ultimately about those individual stories, the victims and their families, those families who searched for answers. Their loved ones had gone missing, they didn't know what happened. And it was like this nightmare that they couldn't wake up from. Not knowing what happened was worse than knowing the truth and the facts about the events that occurred. After that, I worked the next decade all over the world doing similar types of work. Peru, Nigeria. In 2009, I ended up in Nigeria actually traveling from Lagos to Asaba, which is this little village on the Niger Delta, or Niger River, just north of the Delta. I was actually six months pregnant at the time. But we were there to map a mass grave that had occurred from the 1967 Civil War. When we arrived, we were so welcomed by the community. We were taken to the local palace and met the king. We were given traditional clothing to wear, and we uh, were even given Ibu names. There was a feast and dancing. It was a wonderful experience, and everyone there really committed to the project. It was their parents and grandparents that died in that tragic event and that they were hoping to get some sort of accountability for. But as that day unfolded and those events unfolded, in a little village about 200 miles north of us, there was another massacre. Right there in 2009, 400 people were killed in a church. And what was amazing was there was such a lack of media attention and discussion, even within that country, about what was happening. I found it profoundly sad and tragic that here we have this historic case and this modern case. And it really made me sort of question, is this anthropology and what 
I had wanted to do and dedicate my life to. Um, but from that experience, um, I always thought about those victims and those families, and that is what the personal connection was all about. I don't think that ultimately we make big changes in the world by doing things on a global scale. It's not about policy. It's about interpersonal relationships. Today I live here in Tampa with my husband. Our two little boys, Sean and Reed, are part of this wonderful CDS community. And we've tried to build at USF and in our area the same sort of model where we take science and the skills and the techniques that we have and apply it to some of our most forgotten people in our own community. Florida has thousands of unsolved homicides, nearly 900 victims who remain nameless, unidentified persons. While cold cases isn't the biggest problem in the world, it is for those families who are searching for someone, if it's your brother or child that got, has gone missing. And so with that, we've tried to use forensics in this very applied and practical way to bring some resolution and peace to families who are searching for answers. I'd like to share one more story with you that I think captures all of this and really comes back to the theme of what we're talking about today. In 1940, a long, long time ago, there was a little 13-year-old boy, George Owen Smith, who ran away from home with his harmonica. He uh, was off to Nashville to try to be a country singer. He, kept, he caught a ride with an older boy who, as it turned out, had stolen the car they were in. They were arrested. Owen was convicted and sent up to this reform school in North Florida. By that time, 1940, that school already had a 40-year history of scandals, abuse, all sorts of rumors about things that had happened. George ran away, was caught, brought back, ran away again, and that time he went missing. The family, as you can imagine, was distraught, but they were poor, they didn't have a car, they actually didn't even have a phone. They were going to borrow a car from their minister, who uh, was going to loan it to them so they could go up and figure out what happened. Months went by with no answers. The day before they were to arrive, the superintendent actually called them, and uh, through the minister and said, we found his remains decomposing under a house a couple miles away. The family still wanted answers. They thought the school was responsible and asked that they send his body to a local funeral home so he could be shipped home. When they arrived, the school didn't actually do that. They had just buried him out in the woods in an unmarked burial ground. His little sister, Ovel, who today is 76 years old, uh, still remembers being there and being shown this mountain of dirt uh, and was told that this is your brother's grave. It didn't sit well with her, and she dedicated her life to finding truth and justice. She became one of Florida's first female police officers in 1952. Actually had to wear a dress anytime she hit the streets in Lakeland on her beat. But I became aware of her story in 2011 when the Tampa Bay Times had done a little uh, five-minute video clip about her and was really touched by her story. She actually reminded me a lot of my own grandmother. And I knew that we had the capacity to help her. After all, looking for missing persons is exactly what we do every day. And so we set out to find Owen and brought all the resources that geology, anthropology, forensics has to offer, a huge team with um, survey and remote sensing. We knew that about 100 children died at that school, but no one knew exactly how many were buried there. Officials there thought maybe 30. We ultimately got permission to excavate those graves and return them to families. We found 55 burials. Then almost two years into the project, um, oh, let me back up, we, we brought all those remains back to USF to do all the things that we do in forensic anthropology, try to figure out who these people were, create facial reconstructions, send samples off for DNA testing, create this profile of who you are based on your biology, your stature and your age and your health. 
And through that process, through that DNA testing, after two years, we finally got a hit, a match. It was George Owen Smith. And I was thrilled beyond words. I drove to Ovell's home to share this news with her personally and to tell her that her 73-year search was over. Sharing that with her, I think, changed her life and mine and just made me realize this deep personal connection that what we're doing is ultimately about hope. That's what her story teaches us, that you never give up. You can solve some of the most challenging problems no matter how long it takes. Maya Angelou, the writer, reminds us in something that she wrote that it is not just our mission in life to survive, but to thrive. And we do that with passion. Passion is that energy that propels us forward, that, that helps us find meaning and joy in life. It is what will help all of you reach your goals and find uh, your dreams come true, no matter what they are, if you're willing and brave enough to show up and, and be there for it and help you find the meaning in your life. So be brave and live your passion. Thank you.